Don't expect developers to be security experts. All right, everyone can hear me okay? Okay, good deal. All right, I'm Melissa McKay. I'm a developer advocate with JFrog. I've been there for about three years now. Prior to that, I was a developer, first and foremost, for over 20 years, all the way from lowly intern to principal engineer. So lots of experience there. Um, not so much in security, though. So uh, recently I did a little project with a gentleman from Nginx, uh, with Damian Curry, and we just did a little, you know, just a question and answer session, interview session, informal conversation about all of the things involved with um, putting together a software project. And by that I mean like a, a cloud native project. We, we picked a Java Spring project and just walk through all the steps that might be necessary to get that thing up and running out in production. So we had several episodes. Um, we talked about planning, setting up, uh, security, deployments, updating, um, observing the application. And it was pretty incredible the things that we ended up talking about that we kind of took for granted that people know already when they start a project, a software project. So we We okay? <laughs> okay. There might be a low battery or something here. And um, this one was really interesting. There were a lot of things that came up. Um, it was interesting to get a developer's perspective on this as well as an ops perspective. So I was on the developer side. Damian Curry uh, was on the ops perspective. So this was my introduction to security. Way back when I was an intern, I was given just a list of tasks to do. And how many of you recognize this? Yeah, it's just you know your typical uh, Apache Tomcat web page that might show up if you don't have it obfuscated somehow. So that was my task, was just to obfuscate this. Um, it was really the first time that it even occurred to me that you would might want to hide some things. Now, we can argue all day about whether that's the right thing to do. Uh, today, that's obviously probably, you know, you want to do a little more than just to hide the stuff that you have that's vulnerable. But the reasoning way back when to do this was just the fact that if you were to have a vulnerable version, you wouldn't want to announce it to the world. So obviously, um, you know, this was something that uh, introduced me to all of the problems that you can have. And we can all agree that this is a problem. I think there's been several talks today about security already. And um, for an organization, this can mean a loss of money. This can mean a loss of credibility, uh, especially if they don't have an action plan to immediately solve an issue when it happens. And we've seen this with some famous hacks. Um, this one, the Equifax data breach, old but good. Uh, this happened March through July of 2017. There was $1.4 billion in cleanup costs associated with this hack. Uh, 143 customers, million customers were involved. And obviously this was um, the Apache Struts vulnerability, something that we knew about, but it wasn't patched in time. Next one, log for shell. Um, I think we all are very familiar with this one. I'm going to speed back speed through this, but um, just to point out, uh, 70,000 open source projects were using Log4j as an indirect, or a direct dependency. We'll talk about indirect dependencies in a moment. Uh, 174,000 using it as a transitive dependency. So pretty big problems for the community to solve. Uh, just a random Google search, I went out looking for any blogs or any information on uh, security breaches. And, and the biggest ones so far that we all hear about in the media are data breaches. Um, there's a lot of money involved in this. It's a huge motivator for hackers. And there are several of them every month. And this particular website updates pretty frequently. The last time I grabbed it was September. I'm sure there is a bunch more information for October. But there were some things that... Um, I noticed right away uh, when looking through all of these breaches. Um, just, was it a week and a half ago, I got a notice in the mail about uh, this Move It vulnerability. 
And it, it was a warning to me as a consumer of something or other that my data you know, is now out there um, due to this hack. And sure enough, on this site, there are three other cases of this MoveIt application um, being you know, responsible for some of these data breaches. So interesting that we keep repeating these problems over and over. Um, this has been increasing over the last few years. Uh, lots of money involved, $4.45 million, um, according to IBM's data breach report. And I, we need to solve this. Um, everyone agree with this statement? As a developer, it is my responsibility to write code that is secure. I feel that this is important. This is true for me. Um, does it sound reasonable? Yes. And with everything that we hear about in the media, there's a ton of resources out there today than we've ever had before. This is just an example of one um, put out by OWASP. Um, this was a joke essay, OK? So this is, this is kind of fun. It made me laugh. Um, I put a QR code up here if you want to go check it out. Um, but OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project. It's a nonprofit foundation that works to improve the security of software. There's a ton of resources here. This essay is usually, it's pretty funny because it basically lists ways to write insecure code. And I picked out some of the more uh, funny ones. Um, always use default deny. I like this one. Deny that your code can be broken. You know, prove it. Prove that it's broken first before coming to me as a developer and telling me to fix anything. Um, secure languages. I love this one. Pick only programming languages that are completely safe. Do you know any languages that are completely safe? Yeah. We all have our opinions. Um, mixed languages. You know, the more you include, the more difficult it will be to learn them all. So uh, it's hard, you know, understanding security in one language. Uh, if you mix it up, you know, it's harder to understand the security ramifications in other languages. So, you know, this ought to work. All right, rely on security checks done elsewhere. This is something that I'll focus a lot on in this talk. Um, you know, someone else is handling security. Why should we as developers need to worry about it? This, we've got security teams. We have, you know, our ops people. They should all be able to handle the security and leave us alone. Um, trusting insiders. Of course, you know, um, all the data in our databases is perfectly validated and fine. You know, we should be able to, to uh, just trust that the only malicious input is going to come from outside of our organization. And then this one, code wants to be free. Drop your source code into repositories that are accessible by all within the company. This one's talking about, like, giving you know, company-wide read-write access to every repo out there. This is something that you probably should not be doing. So educating developers is super important. Um, you learn basically to think like a criminal. And uh, I remember my first time doing this, and, and I was fortunate that I was at a position in my company where uh, we were provided training on a lot of these um, ways that we can protect our own code that we are writing. And I learned all about you know, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, uh, LDAP injection, cross-site request forgery, um, insecure cryptographic storage. Uh, but there's so much more a developer needs to be concerned with. And after going this training myself, through this training myself, I felt pretty empowered. I felt like I knew you know, the, what I could do uh, as a developer on my team, how I can improve our security posture. But it, it turns out that as much as I knew, there was way more that I did not know. And a lot of those issues are coming out you know, pr fairly recently. This was a big one. Um, I'm you know, pretty confident that I can avoid writing weak code myself, but it turns out that I use a ton of code that I didn't write. And uh, there's a, you know, none of us like to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we all you know, want to work on the latest and greatest, create new things. So we're going to be bringing in a lot of packages and libraries that are already out there. Um, just for an example, 
uh, earlier when I talked about the project that uh, Damian Curry and I were working on. This is just one of the components of that project. It's a uh, Maven project. And I just went in there and, and ran a Maven tree and found you know, 114 direct and indirect dependencies. And that was seven layers deep. So these are things that I normally would never, ever even be looking at the source code or understand how they were written or anything. So the entire application consisted of seven microservices, and this is just one of them. There was a report that came out, um, the Open Source Security and Risk Analysis Report. This is a Cybersecurity Research Center findings from 2022. And they scanned uh, 1,703 commercial code bases across 17 industries. Now, when you all go and look at reports like this, make sure to pay attention to exactly you know, how they're getting this data. Um, there is a lot of tendency to, um, I don't want to say like clickbait or cause fear in the community, but it's always a good idea to look at that fine print just to see exactly how, how they're bringing this in. So I liked this report. They were pretty clear on how they're getting their data and putting it together. Um, so they listed you know, the, the numbers of commercial code bases and what industries. Um, there was a bunch of interesting stuff in there. I encourage you to go take a look at this report. Um, I took just three of the graphs that they had listen, listed in there. Um, they're just three of the different industries that were rep represented, and you can kind of see you know, the percentage of um, vulnerabilities in just these industries. Pretty incredible how much it's been growing. And notice the jump in 2020. You know, what do you think we were all doing in 2020? <laughs> Lots of people were bored, I think, and uh, we notice you know, jumps in a lot of these areas then. So if developers didn't write in secure code to begin with, we wouldn't have any of these problems, right? Who agrees? <laughs> yeah, you all, are, you all are smart in here. You know that this isn't the case. Is it all up to developers? Absolutely not. And there are just things that are beyond our control all the way on that side of the development process. Um, there's other things that we need to consider. You all like Rube Goldberg machines? Yeah. So um, something cool about Rube Goldberg is um, he's the only person in the uh, dictionary that has his name listed in the dictionary. So if you want to be famous, you know, this is a goal to, to strive for. Um, I really love Rube Goldberg machines. Um, occasionally, I'll end up at an airport that has one, and I, I can stand there for a while and stare at it. But I went out to look to find the largest uh, Rube Goldberg machine out there, did a quick Google search. Turns out there was a video posted on December 10th, 2021. Uh, this whole machine took about four minutes and 26 seconds. They made the Guinness Book of World Records, and there were 427 steps in this machine. And the most important thing I want you to um, pay attention to is just how happy these folks are at the end that it actually worked and completed, and they got this award, right? So this is my face as a developer when I was first given the responsibility to write a pipeline, right? These are Rube Goldberg machines in and of themselves. Um, getting our software all the way through you know, CI, CD, getting it deployed into production, and then everything that happens afterward. There's a lot of automation in there, lots of stuff going on. So back to this statement. Um, it's more than just secure code, and absolutely not is it all up to developers. There's more to consider, and the reason being is because of attacks like this. Um, SolarWinds attack was responsible um, for 18,000 customers receiving an update that included malicious code. And what made this foolproof was that the compromised file was actually digitally signed. So these folks did not know that, you know that there was a problem. This had to do with the pipeline. Um, something got infected in the pipeline. Um, this was after the developers were concerned. Uh, so this is a slide that I often see in our corporate decks. It's intentionally overwhelming, but this is just you know, the huge ecosystem that we have to work with that we all might be integrating with different sets of tools 
during this whole process of you know, starting with committing code at the very beginning all the way to deploying code at the end. And just um, these, where these red arrows are, this is every time in this particular um, diagram that we refer to dependencies. So these are all places where we could potentially be weak, lots of places where we can get tripped up by a malicious actor, lots of places where um, software components might be transferred from one location to another, um, where dependencies might be pulled and pushed to another location. Uh, these are all places we need to consider in our code bases or, or in our pipelines to make sure that we're protected. And one attempt at this, and I say attempt because this by all means is not foolproof. This is just evidence that you know more community and more organizations like this are getting involved in the process. This is Salsa. Um, this is an attempt to measure an organization's progress to help give them goals to improve. And I don't know if a lot of you have noticed or have tracked the progress of this particular effort. Um, there was like a dot one release that had a lot of information and detail on um, accomplishing for you know certain levels. And then there was a release that came out, the 1.0 release, which seemed to kind of lower the bar a little bit. And I think you know it was probably just in response to the fact that so many organizations out there are just not ready yet for this. Um, it's too overwhelming to even you know get to a later stage in development and be able to um, proceed. So I would encourage any of you interested in this project to please get involved and please put in your voice because this is you know it hasn't stopped development on this has not stopped, but um, you know we do need community voices that can uh, have some input on what which stages are relevant for organizations and what details we need to include in this. So I'm going to talk a little bit about other attacks that you know maybe a developer might not be familiar with and how many of you were in um, Steven's talk this morning and saw this one? All right. So for the benefit of those that don't know what a dependency confusion attack, um, this one's pretty interesting. Uh, it was described by Alex Burson, and I'll give you a QR code for him in a moment to, if you want to go read the full article. Um, it turns out that most projects have a collection of dependencies that need to be collected. Uh, they include open source or publicly available packages as well as internal packages. And this as, is an example of an NPM uh, JavaScript project that has some internal package names highlighted. Um, it, these package names are not secret. When you make requests to NPM in order to get everything else collected, um, these internal package names you know, can get leaked in the request. So it's no secret that you've got you know, stuff going on internally. And basically, just a diagram of how this works. Uh, for example, if you make a request for this awesome corporate lib, and it's expected to come from an internal repository, something that you've built, you know, that your organization has built and created, might be proprietary. Um, and then instead of specifying a version, perhaps you just indicate that you want the latest version. This makes sense, and this is reasonable. But the package manager in this case sees that there's a greater version of the same named package in a public repository. And of course, to make your life easier, your package manager wants to satisfy your requirement of getting the latest, so you could potentially get an awesome corporate lib that is not what you expected. Uh, one way to protect yourself, of course, is to use a package manager that has features uh, where you can prevent this type of activity. Um, obviously, We'll talk about this a little bit later, but um, this idea of always collecting the latest, maybe instead you want to specifically request the version you're looking for, um, this will help as well. So yes, Alex, um, he was able to make a number of discoveries. He made a lot of money doing this through bug bounties. And th there's another fun one. 
Um, this problem you know, has more to do with managing open source packages and libraries themselves, not really about a malicious package or a vulnerable package. And this illustrates a trap that we fall into when we, re we rely solely on public repositories for our builds. Uh, we can find ourselves depending on a little library, never caching it, never having our own copy of it, and then suffering the consequences later. And that's where we got this one, the left pad incident. I'm going to skip through this one. Uh, it's basically uh, an organization that um, basically tricked, you know, they weren't intentionally trying to trick people into getting a, a named package that was incorrect, but there were a lot of people that, um, you know, there was an argument about a certain package name, and a certain someone decided to delete everything that they had in the NPM repo. This caused a number of different problems. Um, such a tiny little file, too, that so many people were relying on. And uh, once that got removed from the public repos, there were a bunch of other projects that suffered from it. Here's another example. This is a really, really contrived Docker file. And it just I just use it to uh, show some of the problems that you can run into uh, with con container image development. First of all, um, you know, making sure that you rely on a trusted image to begin with is your base image. Um, you can use, you know, the Docker official images are probably good examples of more trusted images. Um, there's several in here, but the one at the end, like line seven, I see this a lot in Docker files, um, cases where you rely on some external resource rather than bringing it in internally and having your own copy. Everything that you have for your build, you need to be able to rely on that it will always be there. And that whole running as root, turns out there was a report you know, just last year that came out with Sysdig. Even though we say this, don't run processes as root in container images, 76% are still doing that. So is there any hope? This is all pretty overwhelming. Um, there's a lot of things that have been done. There has been. Um, you know, executive orders that have come out um, to try to improve this process. Um, there's the creation of the CVEs, the uh, National Vulnerability Database, um, CNAs. Those are um, a CVE numbering authority, and my company, JFrog, is actually one of those. These are organizations that can go out and actually um, in produce these um, CVEs, uh, list, get them listed in the database. There's lots of development of tools. Lots of talking about this. There's conference talks about this. Um, education is happening. Uh, there are external resources from other organizations that are like other security teams that are working on this. Um, JFrog has one as well. But there's a lot that we can do as individuals, as developers. We can educate ourselves. Uh, we can go to, you know, OWASP has an uh, excellent cheat sheet. Um, the silly Docker image that I showed earlier, um, the Docker file I showed earlier, there's a ton of more information on how to protect your Docker images, for example, here. There are free courses that are offered by the Linux Foundation. Um, these, you can actually get a certificate if you pay, but you can audit these courses for free at any time. Don't rely solely on public repos. We talked about reasons for that. And manage your dependencies. Um, think about everything that you're bringing in, but not just your dependencies. Think about all of your tooling and your frameworks that are involved. So we're at a cloud native Redux conference. You should immediately recognize what it, this is. Right? Okay, this is the landscape for the CNCF. There is a ton of stuff out there. And I like jigsaw puzzles. I enjoyed this. This went out a while ago. Unfortunately, um, it is sold out. I love that he sold 42 of these. But um, just to you know, talk about foundations, think about this. Um, the Linux Foundation, uh, the CNCF is underneath the Linux Foundation. There's a sister organization called the CD Foundation. That's actually where Jenkins, Jenkins X, uh, Spinnaker, and Tecton, among others, are um, owned uh, you know, or managed. And the thing about these foundations is they have very um, strict rules about graduating these projects. So if you were to look at, um, you know, each of the organizations have a, a technical oversight committee, 
and this is very specifically what needs to happen for a project to be graduated, and one of the requirements is to get a security audit from a third party. So when you're considering bringing in tools and frameworks into your org to use, you might want to consider you know, the accountability that is on those projects that you're bringing in. Uh, can you trust that they are being managed you know, enough so that you feel comfortable bringing them in and using them? All right, managing permissions uh, using those you know, principle of least privilege. Um, there's been a lot of talk about that today, uh, making sure that you're managing your tokens, your keys appropriately, your accounts. Keeping up with maintenance. I want to, I, I always end up in a discussion here about, you know, whether it's okay to update always and continuously to the latest. Who thinks that's a good idea? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, there's a legitimate reason for it, right? Because you think you're getting the latest, you're getting the latest updates, you're getting the latest um, vulnerabilities. Um, but just know that at some point a vulnerability will rear its head and it is easier to update when you're you know, on the latest version than if you're on 10 versions ago. So having that plan, um, good idea. Regularly scan your libraries and packages. There's lots of tools and lots of considerations to con you know, think about here. Um, all of the tools. For a developer, personally, I just want a tool that doesn't interrupt my flow too much. And there's lots of um, you know, examples of this. Uh, there's IDE plugins, so you can actually review the CVEs. Uh, Docker Desktop also has plugins and extensions you can use. And then, of course, you know, um, are you pulling and building? Are you rebuilding when you release? You know, these, these are practices that are not best practices. So who should be invested? Everyone. Everyone on your team should be invested. Um, this is a problem that's going to take you know, more than just developers to solve. Everyone needs to be involved. The community is involved. So um, in order to you know, be able to make progress, you need to have a culture within your organization that will help you with your security posture. All right. I think it went over a couple minutes, but... Any questions? Are you all terrified? <laughs> all right. 